Good morning. And welcome to worship this morning here at St. John Lutheran Church. A special welcome to those who are joining us online. A couple of quick announcements before we start with our worship service. Now, in, uh, in the pews in front of you, you'll find these yellow prayer cards. If you have someone to like, you would like us to pray for as part of our worship service today, please go ahead and fill that up now. You can hand it to the ushers during the singing of this next hymn. And they'll bring it up to us so that we can pray for your loved one as part of our worship service today. Now, inside the worship bulletin, you'll find these, and these are our Connect cards. They're, there's contact information on the front, next steps of faith on the back, and these Connect cards are a very valuable tool. It's a way for you to connect with us and for us to connect with you. And so, for example, if you want to take a look at the back of your bulletin, uh, we have a women's retreat coming up this Saturday at 9 o'clock. It's right here at church. I think last I heard we've got 75, 80 women signed up, something like that. But there's room for more. And if you'd like that, you can either mark the box in the back of the Connect card, or you can stop by out in the lobby today. So, too, we will hold our next uh, new member class here at St. John. It's going to be on Sunday mornings at 9.30 in March. And if you'd like to sign up for that and more information, again, there's a, a box in the back of the Connect card you can uh, fill out, or you can stop by out of the information desk. And finally, I'd like to invite Ms. Sharon Shearhart up to tell us more about this upcoming trip to Ober Ammergau to Germany. Ober Ammergau? That's how it's <laughs> um, Our St. John Germany trip has been in the works for almost, I don't want to exaggerate because I tend to do that, maybe a year and a half or two years, mm -hmm. and, but it's getting closer. The, trip is going to be July the 14th through the 25th, and we are all very excited to have Pastor Mario Lewerquist as our spiritual leader on this trip. We will travel from Berlin to Munich. We explore quaint castles and villages, and we even stay in a monastery that Martin Luther stayed in it, that has been made into a hotel, so it's going to be really great. I'm excited, I was not raised Lutheran, but we will regain a renewed appreciation for the Lutheran Church, and it's due to important reforms affected 500 years ago when Martin Luther challenged the Catholic Church, and he rediscovered the wonderful message, for by grace are you saved through faith. It is the gift of God, Ephesians 2.8. On day number nine, we're going to move forward a little bit. On day number nine, we will depart for the little village of Ober, Oberammergau, situated in the Bavarian Alps with a day, a whole day of leisure to explore that village. On day 10, we will attend the Passion Play and remember Jesus Christ's teachings, his sacrificial death and resurrection. How awesome will that be? In 1633, the people of made a vow that they would perform a passion play every 10 years if God spared their village from the Black Plague, and he did. So 2020, this year, will be the 42nd production of the world-famous play, complete with orchestra and chorus, and it's performed solely by the Residents. <laughs> you know what I'm doing? I'm saving myself from really messing up. I would like to take this quick opportunity to invite all of you to join us on this historic journey as we walk through the life and times of Martin Luther and fulfill a dream that only comes around every 10 years. Maybe you are young enough that 10 years doesn't matter. But if you're like me, 10 years matters. So I feel like if I don't go this year, I may not get another chance. We are now opening our tour up to other churches. Um, so we want to give you um, the opportunity to be one of the first ones to get tickets. Our tickets are, I wouldn't say they're going really fast. $5,000 is a lot of money. But if you're 65 years old, it's not much. <laughs> so take the opportunity to stop by the um, table out in the narthex after the church. If you have any questions, there's brochures there, and I'll be there to answer. Thank you. Thank you. There's more information out in the lobby, so thank you very much. 
We've come to worship Jesus, and therefore, let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we thank you and we praise you. God, you have given us this day. You have brought us to this place. Lord Jesus, come. Move among us. Open up our hearts. Open up our minds. Touch our souls. Lord Jesus, open us up to open us up that we can hear you, receive you, and feel you moving in our lives. For Jesus, we ask this in your holy name. Amen. And our service begins with a brief order of confession and forgiveness, which is found on page 77 in the Green Lutheran Book of Worship, and also on the screen above us. If you would please stand as you are willing to name. We begin this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, Lord, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, I invite you in these moments of silence to confess your sin before your Lord. <coughs> Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Here again the good news. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you. And for his sake, God forgives you all of your sin. As a called and ordained minister in the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all of your sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. And please share with one another a greeting of peace.
Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. prophet Isaiah in the 40th chapter, and God says, To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who made these. <laughs> he who brings out their host and calls them all by number, because of his great power and strength, not one of them is lost. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my Rights are disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow faint or weary. His understanding is unsearchable. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I preach this morning in the name of God, the Father and the Son. Holy Spirit. Amen. So today we come at last to a sermon series that we have been planning for since last summer and working on since November, and that's the 2020 Focus on Faith. You asked some real good questions about faith, about what we believe and why we believe it, and now at last it's time for us to provide some thoughtful answers. 
Now, I've got to tell you right off the bat, we can't possibly answer every last one of your questions. You all submitted 77 questions, and that's more than we can possibly answer just the five sermons of this series. But Pastor Berkwist and I, we will do the best we can to deal with your questions in worship on Sunday morning. And any that Pastor Berkwist and I can't get to, Michelle and I will tackle on our podcast. So if you're not already listening to the podcast, you can sign up using the Connect card right there. Just go ahead and check that box, and we will email you a link to the podcast later on this week. But one way or the other, by hook or by crook, online or in worship, we want to help. We want to help you clear up some of the fuzzy things about your faith and bring them into sharper focus. And so we begin today with the first sermon of this series, which is called, Who Made God? Because you asked questions. You asked really good questions about God, about God's nature, about God's attributes. And we're going to deal with those questions today. And so we'll start with your first two questions, the ones that gave the, the title for our talk today. And here's how they go. How does God live forever? And how was God created? Has he always been there? Did anything come before him? That is, who made God? Well, the short answer is, no one made God. For if anyone had made God, that someone would be God, in which case God wouldn't be God, that someone who made him would be God. So no one made God. You know, there's a reason why we confess our faith every single week in the Creed, and that is to remind ourselves of who God is and what God has done for us. And the creed begins like this. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and of earth. And the Nicene Creed goes on to elaborate on all that is, both seen and unseen. God is the creator of all that is, of all things, of everything, which means that he is unlike anything or anyone else. God is totally different, totally unique. As he said in our lesson today, to whom will you compare me? Who is my equal, says the Holy One? And the answer is no. God is unlike anyone or anything else in all creation because God is not in creation. God is not a part of creation. God is above and beyond and outside of creation. He is the creator. And as such, he is totally unique. You see, everything which exists, everything which began to exist, must have had a beginning, and that's everything in creation. But God did not begin to exist. God has always existed. The very first words of the Bible, in the beginning, God. And then he made the heavens and the earth, but he was there in the beginning. As it says in the Psalms, before the mountains were brought forth, wherever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. God has always existed. God is eternal. Which doesn't mean that he's just really, really, really old, as if he's full of time, so to speak. No, eternal means that God is outside of time, because time is a part of his creation. Physicists speak of the space-time continuum. As God is outside of space, so too God is outside of time. He's not a part of creation. He is the creator. And that leads us to the second question you asked. How can God pay attention to everyone at... And then the child lost attention. <laughs> Isn't that great? How can God pay attention to everyone at the same time? In other words, how can God know everything? Well, God knows everything because God sees everything. He is above and beyond and outside of his creation, and he sees it all at once. It is all laid bare and exposed to him, and that includes time itself because time also is a part of creation. You see, you and I are creatures. We are caught up in the flow of time, but God is independent of it. Past, present, future, beginning, middle, end, it's all the same to God. It's all available to Him. It's all laid out and bare and exposed before Him all the time. If we think of time as a line, a timeline, God is not on that line. 
He is above that line. He is beyond that line. He is outside that line, and so he can see everything on that line all at once. Past, present, future, everything that has ever happened, everything that is happening now, everything that will happen, it's all laid bare before him, and God has an eternity to pay attention to any particular point. God knows everything because God sees everything. And so that leads us to our next question that you all asked. If God and Jesus knows what is going to happen, then why do they let it happen, the bad things? And why do bad things happen to good people? So if God knows everything, does that mean that God causes everything to happen? No. Foreknown is not foreordained. God's knowing that something will happen does not necessarily mean that God wants it to happen or causes it to happen. Let me give you an example. What God wants for us, God's desire, God's will for us, you, me, everyone who's ever lived, is that we should turn to Him and be saved. The Apostle Paul writes in his second letter to Timothy, he says, God who desires all people everywhere to turn to Him and to be saved. That's what God wants. God knows that's not going to happen. And so He pleads with people to change their minds. In the prophet Ezekiel, He says, Why? Why will you die, O Israel? For I take no desire in the death of anyone, but rather that they would turn to me and live. Turn to me, O Israel. Why? Why will you die? There's what God wants and what God knows. But because God knows something will happen doesn't necessarily mean that God wants it to happen, let alone God causes it to happen. Now, scripturally, that's very clear. But logically, it's a tough nut to crack. As a matter of fact, one of the oldest arguments against God, one of the classic arguments from atheism goes like this. If God is all-knowing, he knows that bad things will happen. If God is all-loving, he doesn't want bad things to happen. And if God is all-powerful, he can prevent bad things from happening, and yet, bad things do happen. Which must mean either that God doesn't know about them, or God doesn't care about them, or God is powerless to stop them. But in any case, he's not God. Unless, Unless God made a world in which it's possible for bad things to happen. Because that's the only world in which it's possible for good things to happen too, including the best thing of them all, love. God is love. And God made us in his image to love like him, God made us to love him, God made us to love each other, the two greatest commandments. God is love, and God made us in his image to love him. But here's the thing. By its nature, love must have freedom. Love must have freedom and the ability to say yes or no. Choose for or against. To consent or to reject. Or it's not love, it's abuse. God forcing himself, God forcing his will, God forcing his desire upon us, whether we want it or not. And that's not what God wants for us. That's not how God made us. He didn't make us simply to obey him. God made us to love him too. And in creating a world where that's possible, where we can choose to love God, 
God also created a world where we could choose to not love God. Choose against God's will and desire for us and for other people. Choose to ignore, if not outright, reject the good thing that God wants for us and for everyone else. A world in which bad things are possible. God knew it. God knew it. God knew the risk he was taking when he made the world that way. God even knew what would happen when he made the world that way, that we would reject it. That we would, that we would reject his good will and desire for us and for everyone else and make this good creation of his a hell on earth. God knew it would happen. But that doesn't mean God wanted it to happen or caused it to happen. Foreknown is not foreordained. That God knows something will happen does not necessarily mean God wants it to happen or God causes it to happen. Only sometimes it does. Sometimes God causes <coughs> bad things. As when God destroyed every living thing on the face of the earth in a flood, or when God destroyed entire populations of people in the Old Testament. And this is one of your questions. Why was God okay with genocide in the Old Testament? Why did God command his people, the Israelites, to wipe out other people like the Canaanites? Why? Because of sin. The Canaanites were not innocent. The Canaanites were not good. They gave themselves over to idolatry. They gave themselves over to depravity. They even practiced child sacrifice. And so God commanded his people, the Israelites, to punish them for their sin. Now, when his own people, the Israelites, fell into those same sins, idolatry, depravity, and child sacrifice, God sent other people to punish his own people the Assyrians and the Babylonians who conquered them and oppressed them and hauled them off into exile, and again, because of their sin. Sometimes, God causes bad things to happen for a good reason, to judge sin, and to punish wickedness. Other times, God allows bad things to happen. If God is a loving God, how can he let small children suffer atrocities? How could God allow something like that? I don't know. But this bothers me too. I mean, this deeply disturbs and offends me. And if it deeply disturbs and offends me, mortal, sinful man that I am, how much more must it deeply disturb and offend the holy, perfect, all-loving, all-powerful God? And so why doesn't he do something about it? How can he just stand there and allow it to happen? I don't know. But I do know this, that even with this, even in this, we have to give God thanks. Otherwise, we would not be here. Otherwise, America would not be here for the 61 million children who have suffered atrocities since Roe v. Wade. Sometimes God causes bad things to happen. Other times, God allows bad things to happen. Still other times, God redeems bad things to his good purposes, as when he redeemed the rejection and murder of his son for the redemption of the world. But at all times, bad things do happen. Against God's will, contrary to what God wants, contrary to God's desire, bad things do happen in this world. The world as it is, the world as we experience it, is not the way God wants it to be. It is a world that has fallen, a world that is in sin, a world that is crying out for intervention, a world that is crying out for action, a world that is crying out for redemption. 
And that's exactly what God has done. Redeemed it at the cost of his only son. And that brings us to our final two questions today, which are about the Redeemer. In the Nicene Creed, why does it say that Jesus was begotten, not made? Well, because Jesus is not like you and me. We are creatures made by our creator, created by our maker through the instrument of our mother and our father. But Jesus is different. Jesus is not a creature. He's the creator incarnate. He is God in the flesh. You and I are distinct from the creator, but Jesus is one and the same with him. And that's what begotten means as we use it in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being in the Father. That's what it means, that Jesus is one and the same, the same essence as him. Now, through him all things were made. But Jesus is not one of them, because Jesus is not a creature like us. He is the creator incarnate. He is God in the flesh. And that brings us to our last question that you all asked, and we're going to end here on a light note about aliens. There are probably thousands of planets in our universe. Was or is there a Jesus for each one? And the answer is no. By this point, I hope you know why. That Jesus is the creator incarnate. Jesus is God in the flesh. And the creator is above and beyond and outside of his creation. Therefore, the death and resurrection of the creator incarnate is more than enough to redeem all creation. No matter how many thousands or millions or billions of planets there may be, you don't need a different redeemer for each one. The death of the one creator and his resurrection is enough to redeem them all. I've really enjoyed myself today. <laughs> and I hope you have too, because you asked some really, really good questions. Who made God? No one made God, otherwise he wouldn't be God. How can God know everything? Because he's the creator. He stands above and beyond and outside everything, including time itself. It's all laid bare before him. So if God knows everything, then does God cause everything to happen? No. But God knew what he was doing when he made a world where bad things were possible like this. Why is Jesus begotten not made? Because he's not like you and me. He's God in the flesh, creator incarnate. And so if there are alien life forms on other planets, well, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ redeemed them too. I've really enjoyed myself today. You all asked some really good questions. I'd like to think I've provided some thoughtful answers. And I ask you to share those answers. This sermon goes online up on our webpage tomorrow morning. And then on Tuesday of every week, we send out an email that has a link to this sermon. I ask you to share that email link with your family and friends. I ask you to post this sermon on your Facebook page. Post it online. And then I ask you also to bring your family and friends with you to our second sermon in the series next week, when we shift our focus from God in his nature to God in his grace, and how God gives us grace as we look at the sacraments. What about baptism and communion? See you then. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we thank you and we praise you for this day. Lord God, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us. Not only have you revealed yourself to us, you have given your Son for us, and you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us in his silence. Lord, there is so much about you that we do not understand, so much that is hard for us to believe. Lord God, we ask that these doubts and questions we have may not keep us from worshiping you, may not keep us from loving you, but Lord, use this sermon series to remove obstacles to faith, to overcome objections, that we might love you with all of our heart, soul, and mind. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
And at this time, our service continues with the installation of our 2020 council members. And so those of you who are council members, if you would please come forward at this time. And so while they are walking up here, according to our constitution, in, uh, during the worship service in January of every year, that's when we need to install the incoming council members. Uh, and the way, that, the way governance works in the Lutheran Church, we have pastoral leadership, we have lay leadership too, and you all have elected your lay leaders, and here they are behind you. So, uh, and there's more than this too. Uh, we, we, uh, we installed other people at the previous worship services today. So welcome, it's a joy to have you. St. Paul writes, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Holy Spirit gives them. There are different ways of serving, but the same Lord is served. There are different abilities to perform service, but the same God give, gives to each person the ability for that particular service. The Spirit's presence is shown in some way in each person, but for the good of all. You have been elected to positions of leadership and trust in this congregation. And therefore, you are to see that the words and deeds of this household of faith reflect him in whose name we gather. You are to work together with other members of the church to see that the worship and work of Christ are done in this congregation and that God's will is done in our community and in the world. You are to be diligent in your specific area of serving so that the Lord who empowers you may be glorified by what you do. And you are to be examples of faith active in love to help maintain the life and the harmony of our congregation. And so on behalf of our brothers and sisters in Christ, I now ask you, are you ready to accept and to faithfully carry out the duties of the offices to which you have been elected? The people of God, I now ask you, will you support these, your elected council members, and will you share in the mutual ministry that Christ has given to all of us who are baptized? And together we say, yes, we will. Yes. Therefore, I now declare you as installed as the 2020 Council, the members of this congregation. God bless you with his Holy Spirit, that you may be proved to be faithful servants of Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's give a big old round of applause. So these are your council members. If you ever have questions about the church, uh, what we're doing, why we're doing it, where we're heading, you can ask them too. And while they're returning to their seat, please, if you would, stand as you are able as our service continues with our confession of faith. Living together in trust and in hope, we confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. And together we say, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, according to the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated. 
We also come to you with thankful hearts. Thank you for all that you provide us. Thank you for the rain that you gave us this past week. Help us to be good stewards of all things that you have given us. Lord, in your mercy. Thank you for the freedom to worship you without threat of persecution. Thank you for claiming us as your own through the message of the gospel. Most of all, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. And Father, we pray for all those who are suffering because of persecution throughout the world. Strengthen their faith during their struggle and help them to remain faithful to your word. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, you've given us so many examples of faith which you have shown us through your word. Help us to be like those examples and maintain unwavering faith and belief in your promises. May we be strengthened by your word and help us to meditate on it daily, knowing that you have the power to do what you have promised. Help us to fully trust in you, even though we don't understand what your plan may be for our lives. Lord, in your mercy. Father, this morning we pray for the relief trip to the coast. We ask your continued guidance as we serve our brothers and sisters who are still recovering from Hurricane Harvey. Lord, we pray for safe travel for this team and that your love is reflected in all that they do and say. Lord, in your mercy. And God, we continue to remember and lift up all those men and women serving in our armed forces around the world. Please protect them and keep them safe until they return home to their families and friends. Lord, in your mercy. Comforting God, we also lift up those who are in need of your special care and healing. We lift up all who are in residential care. And Lord, today we also lift up Shirley Steidel, Christopher Hefner, Melva Williamson, Jell Olverson, Nancy Phelps. Jimmy Westerfeld, Lee Romaine, Bernice Justice, Marcy Boss, David Johnson, Beverly Wagner, Keisha C., Scott G., Margie and Mark Hubbard, Tanya Berry, Nancy Hilmer, Tim Fleck, Sharon Kenny, Ken Dugash, Lila Meacham, Robin Weiss, Philip Wood, Phyllis Woods, Gloria Gonzalez, Josh, Flo Sager, Matt Cress, Lynn. Holly, Lord, we pray for the Duckworth family as they mourn the death of their father. We also lift up the family of June Stevens as they mourn the death of her brother-in-law, Milton Wolf. Provide them with the comfort and healing, Lord, that only you can provide. Lord, in your mercy. And Father, we pray for Pastor Eric, Pastor Mariola, our new council members, and all who serve you by serving some way in this congregation. We lift them up this morning and ask for your continued guidance and that your Holy Spirit leads and speaks to them and that all that they do glorifies your holy name. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting not in ourselves but in your great mercy toward us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated, as at this time we gather our tithes and our offerings while the choir is the offer to our song.
come out in celebration of Holy Communion. And as Lutheran Christians, we believe and teach and practice that communion is what our Lord and Savior tells us it is, that it is his body and his blood, given to us in, with, and under the bread and the wine, given to us freely, for the forgiveness of our sin and the gift of eternal life. And therefore, all who have been baptized into Jesus, all who believe in Jesus, are welcome to come forward and to receive him at his holy supper. We need today's by intention. Please take the wafer, dip it into the wine. Uh, we do have gluten-free wafers available at each station, and if you would prefer grape juice instead of wine, it is this chalice here that will be held by the acolytes in the center. Our liturgy is on the screens of us. Let us begin. The Lord be with you. Offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord. Sharing our life, he lived among us to reveal your glory and love, that our darkness should give way to his own brilliant light. And so, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. supper he took the cup he gave thanks he gave it for them all to drink saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin do this in the remembrance of me O Lord remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray our Father, Father who art in heaven
Please stand as you are willing and able for our post communion blessing. And now the body and the blood of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace unto life everlasting. Amen. countenance upon you and grant you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Their closing hymn is Immortal, Indivisible, God Only Wise. Go in peace, serve the Lord. <laughs>